as a pulpit rabbi having to speak many, many times over the years to a congregation of people. I early on recognized the need for an in-house critic. And I was blessed with a very good in-house critic who happens to be my wife of 59 years. And so often I would pass things in front of her and ask her to give me a judgment with regard to whatever it was. And sometimes I would say to her, do you think it's too short? And her reply was, it is never too short. When Dr. Shaba asked me to speak, and I met with her briefly and told her approximately how long I was going to speak, she gave me to understand that it was too short, that it needed to be longer. I had never heard that response before. I was unaccustomed to that kind of response. And so I decided it's best to place myself in the hands of God with this little prayer. O oh Lord, fill my mouth with worthwhile stuff and nudge me when I've said enough. <laughs> Rabbi Hillel, living in the first Christian century, was asked to explain Torah while standing on one foot. And his answer was, what is hateful to you, do not do to another. The rest is commentary, now go and learn. Long before him, the prophet Micah summarized Torah in this way. What does the Lord require of you? to do justly, to love goodness, and to walk humbly with your God. And Jesus, a contemporary of Rabbi Hillel, said that the Torah's two greatest commandments are love of God and love of neighbor as oneself. Torah is a Hebrew word for teaching what it means to live. What it means to live. Because this teaching emanates from God, there is nothing ordinary about Torah. And that explains why Hillel and Micah and Jesus and the list goes on and on spend their days trying to embody the living Torah. To put it directly, the practice of Torah is demanding, calling forth an acute type of listening and learning. The world of Torah is restless, probing, argumentative, challenging, Serious, absurd, humorous, and baffling even as life itself. Rabbi Jonathan Sachs, chief rabbi of England, tells of Cohen, who is new in town. And Cohen goes to the synagogue. And he's warmly welcomed by all the people in the community. And he participates in the service, the worship service, and is particularly pleased with the chanting of the cantor. But when the service arrived at the point where the Torah scroll was to be read, that's the Pentateuch, all pandemonium broke loose. It broke loose in the synagogue. Half the congregation stood, half the congregation sat. Those standing said, 
Don't you know you're supposed to stand when the Torah is read to those seated? And those seated shouted back, didn't anybody ever tell you that you're supposed to sit when the Torah is being read? And they went back and forth and back and forth, and he thought they would never be able to get out of there peaceably. But in due time, things settled down, and the service reached a peaceful conclusion. The problem was that the next week, the same thing happened, and the same thing happened week after week after week. Cohen couldn't take it any longer. Now, this particular community didn't have a rabbi. You don't need a rabbi to conduct a worship service. Any knowledgeable Jew can do that. So Cohen decided to go to the community nearest him that did have a rabbi. And he went there, and the rabbi greeted him. And he said to him, Mr. Cohen, what can I do for you? And Cohen said, Rabbi, there's a matter of Jewish law that I need help with. When the Torah is read, do we have to stand? No, said the rabbi, that's not the tradition. When the Torah is read, then, do we have to sit? No, said the rabbi, that is not the tradition. Well, listen, rabbi, I, I really need some help here. In my synagogue, half the congregation stand, half the congregation sit, and they argue and shout at one another. And the rabbi looked up, nodded, and said, yes, yes, that's the tradition. That is the tradition. Passionate debate defines Jews. Whether Torah did this to them or they did it to Torah cannot really be explained. Originating in a desire to know what God expects of us and what we expect of each other the Torah pursuit of learning is not passive. Emmanuel Levinus, a great teacher of our time, grasps the anxiety. He notes that the language of Torah is so suspicious of words that do not stutter that Moses, its greatest prophet, was slow of speech, slow of tongue. So getting to what in heaven's name does the text mean is the challenge. And truth extraction is the issue. One of the sayings of the rabbis is, an ignorant person cannot be pious. An ignorant person cannot be pious. The message, you have to question. You have to probe. You have to argue. You have to think. You have to reason. because that is the practice of Torah. While there's great anxiety surrounding what does the text mean, there is no anxiety with regard to the text itself, that is, to the preparation of the Torah scroll. That is accompanied by a lot of certainty and exactitude. And I have brought with me a small Torah to show you. This is a Torah scroll. Having said that, 
It is not a kosher Torah. What is a kosher Torah? A kosher Torah is one that is written by hand. This is printed text. A Torah scroll is written by hand using a quill type pen with special ink done by a scribe who has to be very skilled in the calligraphy that is part of the Torah, the writing of Torah. It takes about a year to complete a Torah scroll. Every letter has to be perfect. If there's a malformed letter, the Torah scroll cannot be used for worship. Before the scribe writes the name of God, he must pause and wash his hands and then write the name. The wooden rollers are called tree of life. And they hold the Torah scroll in place. I'm going to open it up so that you can see what it looks like. So it looks like this. I don't know how well you can see it, especially those of you in the back, but it's all in Hebrew, and it is read by the person conducting the service and uses a special pointer. to read the text. There's a line in the prayer book that says this, in this scroll is the secret of our people's life from Sinai until now. What is in that text are the books of Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy, the Pentateuch, the five books of Moses. And those names convey the theme, more or less, of each book. The Hebrew names, by contrast, come from the first significant word in the beginning of each book, unrelated to the theme of each book. Torah expands much like a rubber band. When Torah tests its intent against real life, it collides with the teachings of the prophets, which make up the second section of the Hebrew Bible. This is a resounding challenge to what passes for faith in our social, political, and individual pursuits. The prophet's stand is one of tough love, which they understand to be deep love. Because they love their people, they scold them for failing to listen, to learn, and to live Torah. For example, 2 Isaiah, speaking of God, in his love and pity, he himself redeemed them, raised them, and exalted them all the days of old. But they rebelled and grieved his Holy Spirit, and then he became their enemy, and himself made war against them. Tough love, yes, but a love that lasts. The third and concluding section of the Hebrew Bible is known as the Ketuvim in Hebrew, or writings, containing an assortment of different books. 
Esther, Ruth, Song of Songs, Job, Proverbs, Psalms. And this varied collection also spars with Torah in intriguing ways. A Benedictine monk quoted by Kathleen Norris in her book, The Cloister Walk, says, God behaves in the Psalms in ways he's not allowed to behave in systematic theology. He probably means that God behaves that way when he sees us at our messiest. Taken together, the three sections, Torah, Navim, which would be prophets, and Ketuvim, the writings, taken together, they are called in Hebrew Tanakh, which you know as the Old Testament. For Jews, this is the Bible. When the Tanakh was completed in its current form, probably around the year 90 of the Christian era, the Jews were still reeling from the destruction of Jerusalem and the temple 20 years before. The biblical institutions and forms were gone. A million people had been wiped out probably in that war and the people were bereft. No single Judaism existed. Groups of Jews contended with each other, attempting to define what God now expected of them. Only two communities lived and continue to this day. The one represented by you, Christianity, the other represented by me, Pharisaic Rabbinic Judaism. The rabbis became the successors of the Pharisees. And what the Pharisees contributed to the story of Torah is both pivotal and daring. Without their teaching, Judaism would not have survived, and Christianity might have lost its Jewish roots. They asserted that when God gave the Torah to Moses on Mount Sinai, it was given in two forms one written and one spoken. Torah is twofold, written and oral. The argument for oral Torah is linked to a passage in Exodus that when Moses had ascended the mountain, the cloud covered the mountain, and Moses remained on the mountain 40 days and 40 nights. What was happening during those 40 days and 40 nights? The Pharisaic teacher said that during that time, God spoke Torah to Moses. And that presumption offers a means for interpreting the written Torah, thereby enabling teaching to remain relevant to life. Once you have a fixed text in written form, if there is no vehicle for interpreting that text, then whatever is represented of real value in the written text will die. The Pharisaic teaching with regard to the oral Torah provided the means for the interpretation of the written text, which allows that text to still speak to life even in 2011. 
The most striking example of how impacting this became is this. In the written Torah, reference is made to being a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. The Pharisaic teachers interpreted that to mean not just that the priests were obligated to a holiness code, to live by a holiness code, but that all Jews, all Jews, were to live as though they were priests. All Jews were to live by a holiness code because they should see themselves as priests. Now just think of what that means. With the temple in ruins and the priesthood defunct, it made every Jewish household a potential sanctuary. A small temple. So a vision for the future had opened up and rabbinic Judaism was born. It was now possible for the mystery of Torah to surge beyond Tanakh into what is called Talmud. Talmud means learning. For some time, that learning was oral. Oral Torah, not written. And the interpretations and the commentaries were passed on by word of mouth, from teacher to disciple, to the next disciples, and so forth and so on. But over time, too many commentaries, too many interpretations, and everything became unwieldy, and there was the fear that it would all be lost. And so, the oral Torah got written down. In the third century of the Christian era, the oral Torah was compiled into a work called Mishnah. Mishnah means the second Torah. Or Torah renewed. Or Torah repeated. And that Mishnah is one layer of the Talmud. But the process of commentary went on. So even after the Mishnah was written down, you had more commentaries, more debates, more interpretations. Again, from teacher to disciple, disciple to disciple to disciple, and the same thing happened. It got unwieldy, too many commentaries, too many interpretations, and the fear that it would all be lost. So this vast commentary now on the Mishnah got written down in the seventh century of the Christian era. Mishnah plus Gomorrah, Gomorrah means to complete it, Mishnah plus Gomorrah equals Talmud. That's what the Talmud is. It's the Mishnah plus Gomorrah, and that equals the Talmud. The vast commentary on the written Torah, the oral Torah written down. Still, it's not the end of it. The commentary process never stops. The rabbinic saying is, turn it and turn it again for everything is in it. What is the it? Torah. Perhaps it is that sentiment that prompted Rabbi Abraham Joshua Heschel to remark, the word of God never comes to an end. No word of God is God's last word.
So there's a constant reteaching, a constant reinterpretation. On the one side, that constant reteaching and reinterpretation deals with the text of a Talmudic character. But then there's another kind of interpretation, another kind of reteaching. And that's the reteaching having to do with the meaning of Jewish experience. So one type of interpretation that leads to the Talmud is an interpretation of the meaning of the text. The other kind of interpretation is the meaning of the Jewish people's experience. And that's called Midrash. Midrash. Let me try to explain Midrash. If I say Exodus, hopefully, you would immediately think of the exodus of the Jews from bondage out of Egypt. And you would be absolutely right. But in Jewish history, there is more than one exodus. Exodus keeps happening more than once. Sure, there's the exodus of the Jews from bondage in Egypt. There was an exodus in 1492 from Spain when the Jews were expelled from Spain. Coming to our own time, when the Soviet Union existed, there was an exodus of Jews, Russian Jews, who went, some to Israel, some to the United States. And just two weeks ago, I read about the exodus of the last Jews leaving Ethiopia, the black Jews leaving Ethiopia, known as the Falashis, who probably date themselves back to Solomon's time. They, last Jews there, went to Israel. Exodus keeps happening. Destruction keeps happening. There was a destruction of the first temple, Solomon's temple, in the days of the Babylonians. Then there was the destruction of the second temple by the Romans. And again, if we come closer to our time, there is the destruction associated with the Holocaust. So the lessons drawn from events result in a particular type of commentary called Midrash. And here is a midrash to explain midrash. While Moses was with God on Mount Sinai for that long period of time, 40 days, 40 nights, he saw God at work writing the Torah. And Moses asked God, to explain. And God doesn't answer him. Moses looked closer and he saw that God was putting little crowns on certain letters in the Torah, on certain Hebrew letters in the Torah. And if you look inside the Torah scroll today, you can find these little crowns. They appear on seven of the 22 letters of the Hebrew alphabet. And God explained that the crowns are very important. Why? Because they are the hooks on which future generations will hang their interpretations. And without the interpretations, the text is unfinished. That is Midrash. While its search of text is different in flavor from the Talmud, it is nonetheless responding to the same impulse, namely, to want to know what can be learned and then what we must do. 
with what is learned. What holds everything together is epitomized by the central prayer of the Jews known as the Shema. Shema means to hear, to listen, to comprehend, to understand. A Jewish historian noted that the pagan perceives the divine in nature with the eye, something to be looked at. The Jew conceives of God as being outside of nature and prior to it. And God is perceived through the medium of the ear. The pagan beholds God. The Jew hears God. The Shema prayer is the core of Torah and of Judaism. And as you listen, you will notice that it hardly seems to fit what we think of as prayer. It sounds more like teaching, instruction, and that's exactly what Torah is, teaching and instruction. So I'm going to read the Shema to you directly from its source, Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 4, and following. And when I get to the phrase that says, and these words which I command you this day, keep that phrase in mind, because we'll come back to it. Shema Yisrael, Adonai Eloheinu, Adonai Echad, hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. And you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your might. And these words which I command you this day shall be upon your heart. And you shall teach them diligently to your children and you shall speak of them when you sit in your house and when you walk by the way and when you lie down and when you rise up. And you shall bind them as like a sign upon your hand and they shall be like symbols between your eyes that is on your forehead. And you shall write them on the doorposts of your house and upon your gates. In the prayer book, there is an additional paragraph that is not in the Torah, at least not at this place in the Torah, and that is this. It sounds like this. In order, that is all of these things, in order that you may be reminded to carry out all of my commandments, and in so doing, be holy to your God. I am your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt to be your God. This preeminent teaching that enters the prayer life of the Jew already in childhood, because this is the first prayer that a child, a Jewish child, is taught, is continually repeated twice a day at a minimum, and sometimes more. Throughout the life of the person, even to the very edge of death. And if it can be recited before one dies, one is to do so. The Shema sums it all up. The Shema sums up the essentials of Torah by emphasizing the need to listen, to learn, and thereby to live. What does it mean to listen? Listening demands that attention be paid to learning what God expects. Within the Tanakh, the Hebrew Bible, there are questions and contradictions and controversies 
over just exactly what God means us to do. And they're found both within each individual book as well as between books. Well, that's a strange kind of reality. And that strange reality derives from the belief that to know life's lessons, you have to use the mind that God has given to you. That's the only way you can search out his intentions, to use the mind God has given you to search out his intentions. You do it by arguing. You do it by debating. And you do this while listening to all points of view because it's necessary in order to uncover truth. Typically, the Talmud is a sea of commentary with each commentator trying to convince the other. Decisions are ultimately determined by a majority vote of the rabbinic interpreters. Still, every minority view is recorded and respected because today's minority view may become tomorrow's wisdom. Detecting God's will takes time. And it also takes the devotion of energetic minds stretching across generations. Let me move this. I want to go back now to that phrase in the Shema that I asked you to keep in mind these words which I command you. To what does this refer? Which words? Jews know them as the ten words, and you know them as the ten commandments. They are framed by two sections. God's expectations that as a singular one, he is heard and revered, but not seen nor abused, and is worshipped as the creator of time and life. The two gifts, time and life, which are embodied by the Sabbath. That's what the Sabbath is about. The gift of time and the gift of life. The second section of the Ten Commandments hinges on parents who are to transmit the love of God and to teach the expectations we have of one another. That is, not to murder, not to betray family, not to steal, not to lie, not to covet, that is, not to be envious. This critical, all-encompassing task of parental transmission is the reason why they are to be honored. Honor your father and mother. It is a daily obligation for them to model and for their children to learn from the moment of rising in the morning through the activities of the day to bedtime. Marking the home with a reminder of these commandments which are, after all, commitments, explains why Jewish homes have what's called the mezuzah. The mezuzah is a receptacle on the doorpost of the house, which has within it the scroll of the Shema, written just the way a Torah scroll is written. Observant male Jews also wear boxes when they do, when they worship uh, during the week, not on the Sabbath. And these leather boxes, one on the forehead and one on the arm, have 
within them the Shema text, exactly as the mezuzah does. My guess is that right now you're probably experiencing information overload. That need not be a bother, I'm told, because your generation is said to be able to handle all kinds of things at the same time, that you're a, a multitask generation. So I will take the liberty of pushing at you more than one idea at a time. If I say commandments, you will likely think 10. You say commandments to a Jew, and the Jew thinks 613. In Hebrew, commandments are mitzvot, of which it is said 613 are found in the Torah. Are there actually 613 commandments? Probably not, but it doesn't matter. What does matter is that God is the source of Torah, and as such is the commander. And we, as loving respondents, are thereby taught how to live. The reason why Torah is so important is because it's the textbook of life. It's the textbook of living. Responsive love of God is expressed by doing mitzvot. Judaism may be said to be a mitzvot system. As with marriage, the relationship between God and us has both a loving and a legal character. The word covenant best defines it. Torah specifies the terms of this covenant, which rests on three pillars, God, Torah, and Israel, meaning the people. God gives Torah to Israel. It is certainly counterintuitive that an erotic work, the Song of Songs, the most intimate of love poems, should turn up in the Hebrew Bible. Even more, that the rabbis consider it holy because it is said to depict the love between God and the Jewish people. This way of framing what covenant means suggests Torah as the collected love letters between God, the husband, and Israel, the bride. But we know that love is not without its conflicts, nor the marriage contract without lawful challenge. While Israel and God mutually are accountable to the covenant, the Bible makes repeated accusations that the Jews are a stiff-necked people. They are obstinately disobedient, even to the point of God threatening to wipe them out. You would think that this would have been enough to shut them up. Nothing of the sort. Jewish chutzpah, in fact, enshrines the right to question God. Abraham, Moses, and Job all do so. It is a habit that will not go away. Here is what Elias Cohen, an Israeli poet, has to say in his work, Hear, O Israel. And you shall love Israel with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your might. And these sons who are being killed for you daily shall be upon your heart. 
and you shall teach them diligently in your heavens, and you shall talk of them when you sit in your house, and when you walk by the way, and when you lie down, and when you rise up. Granted, Israel's repeated sins are copiously chronicled in the Hebrew Bible, yet the covenant is never irrevocably broken. God, as it were, cannot let Israel go, and Israel cannot let God go. The passionate encounter continues. As God tries and punishes Israel, Jewish tradition holds that Israel can try God if it is thought that covenant has been breached. And that right is embedded in the faith that God keeps his promises. Why didn't he destroy Israel over the incident of the golden calf? It is because Moses reminds God of the promise he made to Abraham. Jews do not shrink from calling God to account just as he calls them to account. A case in point is a video titled God on Trial in which a court assembled by Jews in the Auschwitz death camp accuses God of responsibility for the Holocaust. And the verdict after the trial is held, God is guilty. And then all the Jews stand up, cover their heads, and recite the Shema. This insolence has everything to do with what the name Israel signifies. From the Hebrew Yisrael, it means to wrestle with God and with man and yet to prevail. So let me now sum up and conclude. The essence of the Jewish way of life is caught by Viktor Frankl's observation that it is not what you expect of life. It is what life expects of you. Life and its laws suffuse Torah. Though the word religion never appears in the Hebrew Bible, isn't it astonishing that the book that we most associate with religion does not mention religion once. And there are, I think, about seven references to religion in the New Testament, but in the Hebrew Bible, none. By contrast, if you look in a biblical concordance under life, you will find column after column after column of references to life in the Bible. The Jews have been wrestling with God for their full life, about 3,500 to 3,700 years. Their history predates the Western concept of religion, which is why Judaism is not accurately described as a religion. The Jews heard what others did not hear, commanding words that set them into a life that refuses to be categorized as religion or culture or nation or race or faith. Everything for them is inextricably bound up together. It is inseparable.
from this small people, less than one half of one percent of the world's population, a population which by the end of 2011 will be seven billion people, of which two billion are Christian. Harold Bloom said that there are about a hundred plus Christians for every single Jew on the globe. A hundred plus Christians for every single Jew on the globe. From this small people, with a population at most 14 million, came the religious heritage of the Western world. The Jews remain engaged with that world, summoned by the call, Shema Yisrael, Adonai Eloheinu, Adonai Echad. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Thank you.